think, once I hear any objections, I think uh, it shows her committee. Yeah. Okay. Well, everybody, welcome to the October 21st, 2013 meeting of the uh, New York City Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes from August 6th? Second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So um, I am very, very pleased that we have two honorary guests here with us today. Um, the first is the 2014 Youth Poet Laureate. And I just want to read the first couple sentences from our press release that went out today. Um, NYC Votes is pleased to announce that Ramya Ramana has been selected as New York City's Youth Poet Laureate for 2014. Ramya, a first year student at St. John's University, delivered the winning performance last week during YPL's voting theme spoken word competition at Lincoln Center to claim the Youth Poet Laureate title. It's not your problem. The voting theme poem that Ramya composed for this the competition is shown on our website and the videos are available on YouTube. So I encourage everyone to go out, run, go watch it, share, share it wherever you go. This is fantastic. So we also have with us, and let me pull up with the other things, I'm making sure that we have um, the, uh, I don't miss anything here. Um, so we have here the uh, Poet Link winner, um, Anthony Ragler, so welcome. He's a Mercy, Mercy College second year student, so really pleased to have you. Thank you. Um, and uh, here with me, I also have a couple things. I have um, a letter from the um, mayor of New York. <laughs> Pass around. Um, to, uh, it is in, I, won't, I won't read the whole thing, but um, it was, um, I think, um, just to, to read a couple sentences here. Um, for many Americans, the right to vote has been a victory achieved after, after decades of struggle. Voting protects all of our other rights, but of course that is only true only when we vote, and far too often New Yorkers do not. It is especially important that we encourage our city young people to vote, as they are the leaders of tomorrow. And through the YPL program, NYC Votes has energized thousands of young voters through their spoken word poetry competition. So thank you. And uh, we can circulate this. Somebody wants to see this. And um, we also have a proclamation that, um, that NYC Votes was presented. And for the, um, for the uh, city of New York, um, so from uh, Gail Brewer, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing that's in, um, I think, the same text size as our ballots. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, um, it's uh, to commend the Youth Poet Laureate program. And so especially for Cheyenne and Sabrina and Anita, who have worked so tirelessly to, to build this unique partnership. Um, so congratulations, and thank you very much for all of your efforts. Uh, it's getting bigger and better every year, and from a very small start, it's really, you guys have really made something special out of it. So that's terrific. Pass this around to you. Do you want a magnifying glass? <laughs> Yeah, that could be a really cool thing to hand out the phony booths. So <laughs> so so exactly. So it's your hand out oh, plaques. Um, okay, so um, anyway, so welcome. And uh, uh, Amy Lopress, executive director. Okay. Um, I just have a couple of things to update on. Um, we, uh, this Friday is a filing deadline, I guess the last one before the general election for candidates who are running for city office. Um, we are busy um, on, you'll hear some about the, some voter engagement programs from Onita and her staff in a minute, but uh, I just wanted to update the group on a couple things. Uh, it's tomorrow is our first citywide debate sponsored by, by the CFB between the two candidates running for mayor. Uh, sponsored by WCBS and their partners. Um, the final debate of the 2013 debate season is going to be on October 29th, uh, sponsored by WMAC and their partners, held in the 
same studio that they filmed Saturday Night Live, although we are been com absolutely committed, uh, assured that we will not run into anyone associated with Saturday Night Live, although it's in that <laughs> studio. Um, uh, but uh, so that's exciting. Um, the print photo guide, which you see beautifully, this beautiful guide displayed out here, has been mailed for the general election. Uh, Again, this print guide gets mailed to every household with a registered voter in the entire city of New York. Um, it is translated, and it, all, it goes throughout the whole city um, in English and Spanish, and in certain sections of the city in Chinese, Korean, and for the first time this year in Bengali. Uh, so you should look for it in your mail. Um, how many, how many did you actually mail with that number? It's about 4.2 million this year. One thing I'll just say is that I want to thank yeah. Elizabeth and her team for all her hard work. I mean, you guys work so hard on this. It's such a struggle every year, and mm -hmm. with the video voter guide as well. And um, just to just to note, um, if you go to your mobile phone's browser at www.nycvotes.org, you can find all the same information on the on the app. And it's thanks to Elizabeth and her team and the tech team here at the CFB who made it possible to provide that, mm -hmm. that uh, integration. Um, and the voter guide is also, I mean, we have video for, platform, we have the, our mobile app, we have um, the print guide, we, the, we also have an online version of the guide which also can be viewed in, in a mobile browser if you uh, so choose. Uh, one very important thing about this year's voter guide which makes it very, very useful is it includes information about the six ballot initiatives that are on the ballot this year, which I think most people in the city are not aware of. I, that would be good if I could write the right page. Um, but here is a two-page spread that gives a plain language description of what each proposal is and some uh, reasons to vote yes and reasons to vote no. On our online guide, there are actually statements from members of the public um, giving their support or opposition to those. Um, ballot proposals, they, some of the, you know, they affect everybody in the whole state, um, some more widely than others, but I uh, uh, recommend that everybody look at those and be an informed voter uh, by reading about the ballot initiatives. Um, also, I want to report that a unique, from a unique partnership that was uh, developed through our general counsel, Sullivan Todell, who's not here, uh, the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York City took it upon themselves to, we, we provided them with the files, but they translated the voter guide into Russian for the first time this year for mm -hmm. Russian speakers, um, and they um, made that available online. Uh, our staff was helpful in providing them with the files, but also some Russian speakers on our staff were uh, helped provide assistance in proofreading their translation and making some suggestions about their translation and improving it. So I'm going to thank the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York who did that with their own funds and it's you know a big resource for the Russian speakers in the city. Um, and finally, I know I forgot to bring them. Matt, you always have stickers with you. Do you have any? I, I'm actually <laughs> without stickers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm happy to report that the sticker program, which says I voted, we had the competition earlier in the summer, um, and they were distributed at the primary at poll sites, you know, uh, in an ad hoc kind of uh, uh, preliminary way. This, at the, for the general election, will be distributed at all the poll sites by the Board of Elections. They were included in the poll site bags. Um, they were printed and mailed. Uh, they're round for the general election rather than the square ones that were in the primary. Same Statue of Liberty, I voted, design. Um, Anita and Cheyenne have organized a group of youth, which you're going to hear about, to help distribute them too and get, and get energy about that program. But I really want to thank Matt and Bonnie, and who really were the engineers behind this uh, program. Really, people really, really liked it. I mean, when I delivered stickers on that primary day, the, the, the person who was working there said, somebody already asked me where the stickers were. So there definitely, there was a need for that. So I thank um, the staff who really was behind engineering that program. And I received complaints unsolicited from people, friends of mine, who went to 
to vote, and they expected to get a sticker. They didn't. <laughs> so they will this time. Also, we asked people to take a selfie, right, of themselves right. wearing their sticker. Yep. Uh, and they could appear in a future voter guide. Uh, advertisement for that would be I voted uh, sticker. We have a little in this voter guide. We have a, it's mostly staff. <laughs> well, because we didn't, we didn't ask for people's permission. Yes. So um, <laughs> whether, whether they took, whether they sent their selfies, so we didn't have time to ask them. But but a lot of people did it. Yeah. If you check our web, uh, our Facebook page, yeah. right? So a lot um, of selfies. Lots of selfies. It. I can't find it <laughs> now. Oh well. There it is. There it is. Anybody had to delete? Uh, no, 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 no. We won't get that. No, no, no deletable. <laughs> but these all incredibly adorable ones of little children and adults wearing their sticker. <laughs> talk a little bit more again about our Youth Poet Laureate program. So happy that we have two of our winners here this evening. Um, the Youth Poet Laureate program was really special this year also, and I wanted to mention also that Amy was one of the judges, so good work, Amy, good work. <laughs> is that it, it was the launch of a partnership with Lincoln Center. So after several, uh, after almost a year of planning, and I'd like to really recognize someone here, Catherine Loving, who was really uh, working with us on that, and thank you, Catherine, for your part. Uh, but it was Gail Brewer's vision that these two organizations could come together because we each had spoken word programs and they were both city-based, uh, civic-based, voter-based, so we were able to come together and uh, on last Thursday we announced a partnership which would mean that we will continue to work together in 2014 for a calendar year long of voter theme, spoken word, programming and outreach to uh, youth all over our city. So we're really excited about that. And the young people who are here today really uh, stand for that because they are going to be those ambassadors who will work directly with Cheyenne, our youth photo coordinator, and make sure that they go around town registering their peers, uh, talking to them about voting and how do they feel about it, performing their winning poems. So we hope we're going to have a very enriched year. We're going to start the year off with uh, Lincoln Center's Poet Link Contest, and it will feed and end the year with our Youth Poet Laureate Contest. <coughs> so we have a special treat for you this evening because they're each going to perform. One is going to perform a personal poem, and the other one is going to perform a voting poem. So we hope you enjoy it. Ramya, would you like to go? Tweets after the announcement of the 2014 Miss America. Nina Babaluri. One. Miss New York is an Indian. With all due respect, this is America too. Miss America. You mean Miss 7113? Congratulations, Al Qaeda. Our Miss America is one of you four. Miss America, foot long buffalo chicken on whole wheat. Please and thank you. I am a first generation Indian American from New York. My family is from South India, and we speak one of the 398 living languages in our country called Telugu. Nina Davaluri is a first-generation Indian-American from New York. Her family is from South India, and they speak one of the 398 living languages in our country called Telugu. When this soil is all you know, do not hesitate to make sandcastle out of chest. When their mouths flail like sneezing guns at the epitome of your bloodline, do not fear the consequence of pulse. 
Simply stand firm. Staying still is one of the hardest things mankind can do. Use the esophagus of your eyes as weaponry. Talk to them in chatterbox format. Tell them that this soil is yours. That this flag is yours. That this birth certificate is yours. Speak of caste system. Speak of Gandhi. Speak of Nehru. Speak of woman being held like Jonah in belly of a world that does not speak well of its own body. When your body becomes a half flashback of the twin towers being bent like scoliosis, remind them of all the pelvic bones broken because their ancestors want to conquer what did not belong to them. When they say you are a terrorist, Nina, say back no. We are all the ground you could ever wish to be. Say back, no. This land does not vomit our limbs. It cages them like young child of home. Say back, no. Your great grandfathers raped, killed, and oppressed every race in the world. You are the biggest terrorist I know. People will always try to tell us that we are not American. Smile and show all the red waiting to be scrawled out in our gums. Open our eyes, let the whites of our pupils splash out like volcanoes. Give our hands tantrum method, and let it be known the blues of our veins will to sing its vocal cords like a homeless man who's been silenced in the genocide. Show them that flag that tattoos its mantras all over your body. Show them that walk that you do, that Indian thing that you do. Keep dancing, Nina, keep dancing. Stomp your feet like resurrected rhinos getting shivers to movement. Do that dance, bring all of that motherland you can in here when they mock you keep dancing when they laugh at you keep dancing when they mold you into animal construction site do not stop moving your feet when they laugh at us when they hurt us when they kill us when they terrorize us let them dance make them rise with us make them do that hip turn with us dance sing stomp say here's your foot-long buffalo chicken on whole wheat you're welcome participated in the Youth Poet Laureate competition and is also the winner of the Poet uh, competition. And he's performing his voting poem. Insignificance in five parts. One, politicians rarely appeal to you. The assumption is that you don't have the knowledge to make an informed decision on who our leaders should be, and you're not planning to vote anyway. Therefore, it is pointless to spend time lobbying to a lost cause. You are deemed insignificant. Two, the general public dilutes the importance of elections on non-presidential election years. The assumption is that who runs our city is in any way near as important as who runs our country. Therefore, voter turnout is far smaller in municipal elections in comparison to the presidential election three. The things we write off as insignificant tend to be the foundations to our largest necessities. A cell is one of the smallest organisms in a vessel, but is vital to the survival of any living creature. Just like an atom, one of the smallest particles known to man is the foundation for every substance we know for. The vote for House Representative has impacted our country by giving us 18 of our future presidents the most out of any formal elected official position filed, one missing screw will bring down an entire structure. So the next time the voice of the youth or the importance of a state election is questioned, remind yourself that you are the cell, the atom, the screw that will keep this entire engine running, that you are the heartbeat of a boat that will keep this entire country running. travel together at times and separately. We also have our ambassador team that will travel, uh, but they will also come back and visit us as a group and share with us what they learn and what they experience. So we can look forward to seeing them more often uh, having conversations with us. So if you have any questions with them now or next time. <laughs> 
and editing on the general election 2013 voter guide has been successfully completed. The citywide and five borough uh, program, television programs have been delivered to NYC Media for broadcast beginning Monday, October 28th through Friday, November 1st at 7 p.m. It's also going to be rerun and on Saturday, uh, November 10, uh, 2nd at 10 a.m. The programs can be seen on NYC Gov and um, as well as on public access stations in Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Manhattan. The candidates' individual statements, as was stated earlier, can be uh, viewed on the Campaign Finance Board's web website and YouTube website uh, channels, as well as on nycvotes.org. That's it. And now I'm going to ask Stuart, who we rarely hear from but see a lot, <laughs> to come. You want to go somewhere? Yeah. If you guys can get oh. these, this is what oh, sure. talk about. Yeah. So two years ago, um, we met with the TLC and uh, came up with the idea to put, they uh, talked about having surveys. They were having a touch screen, well, they have the touch screen TV and the apps. And so we decided to, we asked them to put a survey in there. Um, and so this is an analysis of all, all three of the last elections, um, the June primary, the November uh, general, and the September primary. There was a problem with the September primary last year with some corrupted data, so unfortunately we don't have that. Um, so the question one is, did you vote? Um, almost all of, all of the uh, elections, about 20% of people did vote. Um, the majority said the number two is number two. No, I did not vote, but I am a registered voter. Had a shockingly high percentage. Uh, if you take out, I'm not eligible and I don't live in New York, which had the highest percentages because it was only in yellow cabs, so it's in Manhattan. So there's a lot of this. There's between 36 and 40 percent of people did not vote but were registered. So we have a lot of work to do to get people out to vote. Um, and then the second question is, I didn't vote because. Um, well, let's just take out five who not applicable had the highest percentage. But um, if you look at the other questions, um, in June, the highest, per, the highest answer was I didn't know no, enough about uh, the candidates. In November, I didn't like the candidate selection, and then I didn't know enough about them. was the second highest. And then this year, because voting was too inconvenient. Um, question three is what Rate, sorry, pick the voting change you'd like to most, like, you'd like to see the most. Um, in June it was online registration and November was the same. And in November it was also slightly behind that was voting anywhere. And then as you know, last August, Andrew Cuomo actually had the DMV online registration put in there. So now this year, um, vote anywhere was the highest. Um, and from question two, it seems people didn't like, people uh, didn't like the candidate selection, um, and it was too inconvenient. So we see that the voting is too convenient now, um, and people would like to see voting anywhere um, as you know their, their highest choice. And the, the next question is, uh, rate your poll site, and most for the most part, it's acceptable and good, um, which is good, which is a nice thing. Um, and then the last question is where they where they voted, and obviously um, being in yellow cabs. Highest percentage, nearly 50% is in Manhattan. Um, the good, so this, this, these uh, surveys were only five questions, um, and the high, there was a lot of they, they had not applicable in surveys because there was no logic to them. But now this survey coming in, in, in 
gen in November for the general actually has logic applied. So if you say you, you voted, you don't have you won't have to answer I didn't vote because it'll just go straight to um, how did your how did you um, how do you rate your poll site and what change would you like to most see? Um, and there's also uh, we'll be able to put in more questions, so we'll also ask how old they are so we can see who is actually answering what. Terrific. Welcome back to the um, uh, the video board. Sure. Um, do we have any idea of uh, I guess you would call it books or looks or do we have any idea? So, well, we've had a lot of conversations with NYC um, media about that, and they do not monitor Channel 74. They only monitor Channel 25. So, in terms of getting concrete numbers, we weren't able to do that. Um, so I, I don't have a real answer for you. I can't give you numbers. We can probably look and we have, the, do we get hits on the YouTube channel, right? So we can look yeah, it up as yeah, it send you some. And also on our, I mean, obviously we get stiff, uh, hits on every profile on the online guide has, and in the mobile, you know, I know it's a mobile app and if you've done that has the video right there. So lots of people look at the guide and look at the videos. I don't know if the analytics come that precise, we, but you can tell whether people have looked at the... We actually compile analytics to see how many people visited the voter guide altogether, and then you can actually drill down to see individual videos. I guess you'd have to add up all the individual... You wouldn't know, for example, if someone looked at five videos or if, you know, if each hit on a video is a completely individual hit. But there's a lot that we can do with the analytics. Uh, the, my web developer actually ran the preliminary uh, analytics for the online voter guide for the primary, and we haven't, we're haven't. we going to compile that into some kind of report that kind of tells you like how long they stayed on and how many hits, but there was over um, 80,000 visits. It's an amazing job. It's very, very well done. Well, that gives me, it makes us very happy to see that level of, of uh, visitors to it. And they stay on for a fairly decent amount of time, too. They don't bounce away quickly. So they're, they're going through and, uh, and looking at various uh, profiles and videos. And if you haven't looked at, had a chance to look at the online guide, the way the, voter, the videos are embedded in them is a lot more prominent and clear that there is a web video, I mean, it's, you know, it looks like a little TV, I mean, like, you know, it's actually you embedded. See. What? It's actually embedded. embedded. And rather than, than just a link, link to someplace else. So, you, it, so it's, um, so I think people are getting a lot more hits, you know, people looking at the videos, too. And I mean, so I think that you get all the whole panoply, you get the written uh, answers and the video all together. And that's what we were really excited about this year, also with the Video Voter Guide program, that we could produce content that could enrich other platforms. So that's what we were doing with that. And Drew, though, we could probably look at, we know how, what kind of rate of participation we received from the candidates, and we asked them to also share it on their pages. So there's probably another way that we could back into some of those numbers. I would also point out that we translated the scripts into all of the uh, languages that we um, provide the voter guide in, so targeted targeted candidates for targeted districts for the for Bengali, Chinese, and Korean, and um, English, Spanish for every script. And those are available right under the video, so you can actually like click on the Bengali and kind of watch the candidate and pull up the PDF to read it in the language that you need. Or if you were hearing impaired, to read the English. So are we getting, or do we already have a direct link from the nyc.gov new homepage to, you know how the new homepage now profiles different programs? And definitely you're getting, you get a lot more selectors if you're one of these sort of profiled city initiatives. I'll double check on that. Um, I we haven't should. actually looked uh, at it for this, but I'll, if not, I'll contact you. I, there was a woman that I worked with and we had to update our agency. I mean, I, I can help you if not. I mean, I would just go right to... <coughs> to Rachel, our digital mm -hmm. officer for the city, mm -hmm. and just make sure that in the run-up to the election that there, you can decide if you want it going to the video voter guide or if, where you want it going, but we should make sure that the city is putting election information front and center 
Absolutely. We even have a promo they could put on, yeah. you know, like a, an image that they could put, that they would click through. Yeah, most likely they were probably, has, they would be hesitant to do it for a primary, but for a general, I think it makes a lot yeah. of sense. And they, they actually, did, they actually okay. did direct to us from okay. when they go through yeah. the primary, and so we expect okay. to get that same sort yeah. of uh, uh, coverage from the yeah. general. So. Yes, and Stuart has been managing that through Do It. So we do expect that, and they put it, they feature it in some of the neighborhood sections as well. Thank you. Good report. Um, um, anything else? Yes. So, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to add that the work that Stuart has done also, the surveys will go on, we're hoping to look to put it on our website and on the mobile platforms as well so more people can participate. Uh, I'm going to ask Sabrina, she will talk about National Voter Registration Day. Good evening, everybody. So I just wanted to update on our outcome for National Voter Registration Day. We actually had the largest efforts um, in New York State when it came to getting partners involved. We had over 100 partners, but we had some really great partners who came um, through for us on that day, one being HHC. Um, they had over 15 campuses or hospitals <coughs> doing voter registration. Um, one of them in particular did like a jazz night, so people really got involved and really tried to make sure that they were getting people out to register all day. We partnered with NYPIRD and they did a voter registration on Kiwi campuses. We did something at Google, JP Morgan Chase, KPMG, Harlem United did um, several voter registration drives and the Food Map um, New York Organ Donor and the Food Bank of New York also did voter registrations. Overall, for the day, we registered a little over 1,500 in that one day through our partners. And CFB staff really came through because we have a small group. We had staff members at Google, JP Morgan Chase, KPMG, some of the corporate companies wanted NYC vote staff. And there's only one Cheyenne, one Stuart, one Anita, one Sabrina, one group. And we were all everywhere. And we ended our day with the National Association of Voting Elected Officials, and we hosted a forum and informational on voting for newly naturalized citizens. And um, that also was part of what Omega did. We launched our day um, with registering people at naturalization ceremony. So it was a great day. Okay. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, and then just quickly, I'll just say that an outcome of National Voter Registration Day was that um, some of our corporate partners and some of our larger institution partners from institutions have agreed to come together under uh, like a subcommittee to support our um, advocacy work in terms of legislation to support voter voter uh, laws. And as part of that, we came back and had a conversation with Eric, who is in charge of our external affairs. We have two of our members here who have agreed to work on that committee, uh, Tony Casino and also Joan Gibbs. And we are going to have a meeting uh, in November, the second week of November, uh, with Chase, who's one of the partners who agreed to be a part of that, and New York Organ Donors. So we are creating an NYC Votes Lobby Day in the state. Uh, and it will be uh, designed and structured by these committee people. And then we'll have a large group of partners who will come with this as well. But the point of it is that um, we want to show that corporate leaders and both private and public leaders also feel that voting can be improved and that they're willing to stand behind it and they're willing to go speak to their legislators about it on behalf of their constituents and their clients as well. So that is something to look forward to. We hope to have more to report in December at our December annual meeting. Thank you. And now I'll just ask Cheyenne if you could quickly give us the youth voter update. Good evening. I'll give a quick update about what we'll be working on and what's the plan for um, next semester. Uh, we just did a Lehman College Jam. They did a, um, a big like club 
sign up, so they invited us to come. We had Hot 97 there. We did a bunch of pledge cards. It was fantastic. Uh, they also signed up to, to light the campus on October 22nd, which is tomorrow. So starting tomorrow, Lehman College campus will be red, white, and blue from the beginning of the campus, which is near the train station, all the way to the back end of the campus. So if we can get a few more can CUNY campuses to sign on before November 5th, that would be fantastic, but they are a great pilot. Um, in terms of the youth voting workshops, we sent a few posters to high schools across the city, about 11 high schools, and they had um, voter registration drives conducted by their students. Um, for the fall calendar, we went to Lehman High School, School of Visual Arts, and we did some DYCD staff trainings. Um, we're building a calendar of voting workshops for the spring semester, which will begin in January. And um, as Amy mentioned earlier, we're doing a youth day of service with the I Voted stickers. So using the uh, model that Democracy Prep did last uh, for the primary, they had a group of their students, actually five groups of their students, ages 13 to 18, handing out um, voter registration forms at various poll sites, and they were wearing yellow t-shirts that said, I can't vote, but you can. So we kind of copied their idea and brought them in as a partner, of course, to um, replicate that initiative. And we're doing a um, I Voted sticker handout with the um, kids. So we have about six groups on so far, including four sites from DYCD, Madison Square Boys and Girls Club, um, Democracy Prep, of course, NYC Service, and YMCA, as well as Generation Citizen. And the goal is to have um, at least five to ten groups of students handing out I voted stickers at poll sites that we assign to them. So that will be a great day. We will also have NYC Votes t-shirts for them, um, and we'll take lots of pictures for social media as well. So that means 100 students. 100 students is the number. 100 <laughs> students we're locking down to um, push into about 10 groups. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm very um, happy, before we open to general public comment, uh, to, to welcome David Pollack, who is the Associate Executive Director of Government Relations from the Jewish, Jewish Community Relations Council of New York City. Um, these are the partners that I spoke about earlier who translated our voter guide into Russian for the Russian-speaking community. And I'm pleased that you are here, Mr. Pollack. I'll leave you your okay. microphone. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Director and, and Chairman Chang. Uh, this is a long time coming because what we have advocated for for a, a number of years is that uh, voter as language assistance material should be available in the same languages as the rest of the um, as uh, the rest of the agencies in New York City. And New York City currently says six plus of the top languages. Uh, I know that uh, this, uh, the um, Campaign Finance Board uh, and the Board of Elections moved on to Bengali, Bengalese this year. Um, talk about uh, Creole speakers in New York City, there are more than 10 times the Creole speakers, and they don't have you know, one of these. And you know, a, a, years, a, a couple of years ago, the Board of Elections uh, excuse was, well, we can only do, we can only do what the uh, Voting Rights Act demands that we do. So JCRC had a, the Jewish Community Relations Council uh, had a, a seminar on voting rights, and we happened to have the Deputy Attorney General who was supervising voting rights for the Obama administration, and I and the Council for the Board of Elections was there, and I asked the question, and he said, and she said, of course, you can do any additional voter assistance that is appropriate in the city. Now, then it became a matter of budget, and. Budget is budget. Uh, and so we made an offer to uh, Sue Ellen Dobell, the general counsel. Uh, let's, if we do the translation and we post it as a PDF, will you link to it? I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> 
because I have uh, come to an increased appreciation of the work that the Campaign Finance Board does. It's an incredible job, and they've been incredibly helpful to us. But, and uh, we it wasn't just merely translating, but anyone who knows is fluent in more than one language knows that it's not exactly an A to B correlation. There are different things. How do you make decisions? For example, in here, people, since the Campaign Finance Board prints exactly what the candidates say, sometimes the relationship with English is less than perfect. Um, how do you do that when you're translating? What do you convey? And knowing, by the way, that Russian speakers happen to be elitist, so to speak, sometimes, often, and they don't like grammatical <laughs> problems anywhere. Um, sometimes uh, candidates use wrong words. They said, you have to save the earth and everything else is mute. So what do we translate it as, mute or moot? <laughs> So we, we went through all those problems. We tried to keep with the Campaign Finance Board's uh, general uh, direction to go as, to, to remain as close as we can to the original. Russian is always longer. I know that when I get translated, because my, my Russian is uh, a lot better after the last couple of weeks, but it's still very poor. And I, I want to thank uh, everyone here for their cooperation and hopefully in a new administration you get the uh, budget to do this yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. How many volunteers did it take? It, it, what, and we, how long did it we, uh, we happen to Dragoon and you know, we'll pay her something someone to do the original translations, and then we just did a lot of staff work and working nights and Sundays. And, uh, it's an incredible, you know, it, 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 okay, you guys, I, we had all of your materials, and that was an incredible first step. But, you know, again, questions, editing the translations, then, you know, tomorrow what I have to do, because your staff has spent hours and hours going at, uh, over what we did, because since you're linking to it, you have to say that this is kosher. To mix my metaphors. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, uh, this has been a project of love for the past month, and it took a lot longer than we expected. Um, you know, and we just didn't, we didn't have a budget for it. But we felt that this is critical because you know, we've been telling people that this is coming out for the last week. And there is such gratitude because, uh, you know, among Russian voters, because they feel ignored. How come we don't have access? Especially the elderly Russians. We have about half the population is elderly. And their English is not so great. So they feel left out. And we've, we've done things over the years for them but this is the first time they have candidate information, and although this looks very thick, they'll read it. So that's what we're that, that's what we did. That's how I spent my uh, vacation. How many Russian speakers are there? Um, there's uh, there are about uh, uh, 225,000 Russian speakers. Uh, what was very interesting, because we knew we can't do the whole guide, just as you didn't print everything. So we said, well, what if we <coughs> printed only some of the council districts? So how would we do that? Uh, and my background way back when, when I went to business school, was market research. And there's a, a, an old uh, formula in market research, usually 20% of the people use 80% of the uh, market. The exception being beer drinkers. 10% of the beer drinkers drink 90% of the beer. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so, you know, I said, I'm sure we can just do 10 council districts. So I went into the uh, census uh, numbers and I assigned each council district and I also do geo -coding. And I assigned each um, census tract to a council district. And it turns out that the 10 districts uh, make up uh, 81 percent of the Russian speakers in the city. So we got to cover the people who don't live uh, in the uh, those 10 districts, mostly on Manhattan. You know, they've already left the womb, so to speak, of uh, Brighton Beach and, and, and Bensonhurst, and they are more fluent in the uh, in, in other languages. So I think just like any other. In the so we just hope that this is a step and a prod for any new administration, hint, hint, uh, to, uh, to really uh, make sure that the budget is here so that you can do this for all the, you know, the appropriate, you know, the six largest uh, language groups. Thank you. It's an impressive effort, and I think the campaign finance board and voter assistance are very grateful. Thank you. We thank all the all the staff that really put their hearts into this job. So with that, I think concludes the agenda. Is there um, public? Um, I, well, I just wanted to introduce Michael Ryan, the new executive oh, director of the oh, no. uh, Collections, who, who uh, will uh, you know, knock in at the end. Uh, but I don't know if you have anything you want to share with us, Michael. Well, I got mine. It came from my house, so that was good. Uh, it came on uh, last Friday. I got mine. Uh, and uh, you know, we certainly, any efforts that are made to further educate the voters, certainly that's something that we're very sensitive to. And, and, and just while you guys are here, I know I, know I was uh, meeting with, uh, it went a little bit late, um, I was meeting with uh, Assemblyman uh, Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to meet with us today, and the reason it was critical to me today was tomorrow where uh, voting, uh, the commissioners will be voting on uh, the canvas procedures uh, and he wanted to make sure that we were complying with his bill, which we certainly are. Uh, there's still going to be a little bit of math for the, uh, the folks to do at the end of the night, but the key is the portable uh, memory devices will be downloaded from the voting machines and transported to the police department before the canvas sheets. I mean, that was one of the problems with the delay uh, you know, on election night is the canvas sheets get done. And then the canvas sheets get done, and then they go back to the police precincts, and all of that information needs to be manually entered. Well, what's going to happen now is we're still going to do the return of canvas sheets for our own uh, checking at the back end, but they will not be going with the portable memory devices to the to the police precincts. So, so for those people that might be familiar with the closing procedures at the end of the night, we're still going to print up the tapes because we have to print up the tapes, and uh, you know, with the EDs and AD results. But the folks are never, not going to have to cut them anymore and tape them all on the wall. We still have to tape that one up on the wall because it's required by law. But it's going to be a long tape. The other two that also are required, one by law and one by <coughs> because we told the AP we would, are going to be returned with the materials back to the Board of Elections. The third, the third tape that we told the AP we would print up is going to be for the AP to crunch numbers days after the election. The, the next day, if they want to even see it for some reason at midnight on election night, God bless them, they can do it. Uh, but the results, the unofficial results that get reported by precinct will be done by upload. And so we're going to download them onto the PMDs and then upload them at the police precincts. You're going to get those results, you know, as close to real time as we can. And as a first step, for the first time, the Board of Elections is going to be printing the, uh, publishing the results on our website as well. The only difference is, because it's a first step, we're not going far off into the weeds. You're going to get aggregate numbers by party for different candidates. You're not going to get the ED-80 breakdowns on, on election night, but you'll, you'll get a running tally that you can continue to refresh. So if, if the Board of Elections website's a place you want to go to look for that information, you go there. If you want to go to uh, the AP website, 
you know, that's, that's a, another place uh, that you can go. So we have that uh, going on, which is, a, which is a good thing. That was the purposes, uh, purpose of my meeting. The reason my meeting with uh, Assemblyman Kavanaugh went a little longer was because we had a long conversation about font size before we got into the uh, actual uh, basis of, of our meeting. And, you know, you, when, I, when I came in and obviously didn't want to interrupt, you were talking about the, the various languages. And we're sensitive to that fact as well. And the other thing that I have been stressing amongst our staff, so I just want you guys to have an understanding that it is stuff that we're looking at. The number of languages that we need to accommodate is not going to get less over the course of time. It's going to get greater. And we have five languages in Queens that we're mandated to accommodate. When you look at the ballot, consider this. You have a combination of parties and independent bodies that have resulted in 20 ballot slots for mayor. 20. So when people think about, oh, it's really Republican, Democrat, conservative, independents, that would typically be four. Well, now, you know, the game of politics being what it is, there they are, right? You know, the game of politics being what it is, well, you know, how many times you hear campaign consultants, regardless of candidate, talk about balance? We need balance. Oh, you know, candidate A has an, an additional line, so you have to have an additional line. So they have their, the, the taxes of two high party, and you have to have the fair party, what, you know, and it's like, and then everybody has a party, and then that's those folks, and then when they amended the city charter, uh, in, in the wisdom, they drove down off for citywide races or city races at all, the number you need, you can be on a ballot for as little as 500 signatures. And since campaigns are not in the business of paying attention to folks who are way at the back end of the spectrum, we don't have a mechanism to challenge the validity of those signatures. So, you know, look. I ran for uh, district attorney in Staten Island twice, lost twice, but it is what it is. And we needed, I believe, I believe it was 3,500 signatures to run for district attorney in Staten Island. And we got over 8,000 because we had the, you know, the party behind us. So think about that. Yeah, you need 3,500 if the number is correct. It might have been 3,000, but whatever. Several thousand signatures to run for DA of Staten Island and to run for mayor of the city of New York and get on the ballot with 500 signatures. I mean, right? So, we have to deal with all that level of complexity, not the least of which is, you know, the, the five languages. So here's the particular problem that we confronted. Although there was some room in the ballots in, say, Staten Island and the Bronx, because we're mandated only to provide that language, uh, that ballot in two languages, um, you still could have had a little bit more, but not a lot more room on the ballots in Queens, I mean, in Brooklyn and uh, Manhattan, because we have three languages on those ballots. I asked the question out loud in public for the purposes of creating this debate. It wasn't done by accident, because we could have taken the safe route and simply just published the ballot in the six-point font as it ended up without inviting that public discussion. But I wanted to make it a discussion for the commissioners to say, hey, look, I think there's a legal argument that could be made to print the ballot in a higher font in the boroughs where the where the uh, where there's room on the ballot, and several things came up. We invited uh, legal opinion from, from the law department, and quite frankly, it was stuff that we had considered um, as well. You you can cut that both ways. You can say, well, hey, like the argument that I made was, and I used it for kind of a bad analogy, but like, you know, maybe because it was always me that was the one talking in class. You know, I said, should the whole school have to take, stay after just because one kid was talking? In other words, we got this tiny little font in, in Queens because we have to. Does that mean the rest of the city should have this tiny little font? Well, equal protection arguments were raised and, uh, you know, Voter Act arguments were raised. And the equal protection being that we have these extra languages on the ballot to protect you know, non-English speaking minority groups. 
are we then appearing to punish them by having a larger font size in a borough that only has two mandatory languages versus having a smaller font size in, in boroughs that, that require five. Now, here's the other thing in terms of voter security and ballot security. Right now, the scanning machines that we use do not account for ballots. They account for pages. So, if we went to a second page ballot, we now have to not only account for the number of ballots, we have to now try to account for the number of pages when we're doing our reconciliation at the back end. So if you're a voter and you smartly have your two-page ballot and you feed it into the scanner, and I decide not to feed in the second page or not the first page, now we're only going to have the number of pages, not the number of actual ballots. And that is a software issue that is from the vendor. Keep in mind that any changes to software must be approved by the State Board of Elections. Nothing is done without their prior approval, which that process typically takes 10 to 12 months. So, I have to go. I have a, my son is visiting a public school. Well, go, go see you. Thank you. I'm looking my daughter was home from college this weekend, so I, 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 I'm awesome. I'm, right. I'm looking forward to getting to, to talking. Very good. Thank you. So, bottom line was, we had a lot of uh, competing interests. And to offset that, we're trying to, and this is where you guys come in as well, in terms of voter education, the ballot marking devices have the ability where you can place the ballot into the ballot marking device and you can raise the font up to, 20, to a 22 point font. So for people that have visual problems, or myself, I wear reading glasses as well, you can put the ballot into the ballot marking device and that will help you. And then the other thing that we did um, was we, for each election district, we're, we're going to have, we purchased signs, ED and AD signs for each election district that are roughly, you know, six and a half to seven feet high. The original purpose of the purchase of those signs was to assist uh, primarily wheelchair-bound voters. Because in the past, we always had the ED and ADs on the table, and if the table was crowded, wheelchair-bound uh, voters had difficulty locating the ED and ADs. Now we have these stands and plastic signs that are going to be up above the average person's height so that the wheelchair-bound folks can come in and immediately uh, identify that. They have now had an, a secondary bonus uh, use. <coughs> At my direction, we purchased what I'll call a ballot poster. And it's the ballot, the exact ballot for the particular election district in the uh, in the polling places and they're going to be hung from the EDAD signs so that when you come up to the table and you get your ballot right next to the table is going to be a full mock-up 17 by 38 of the ballot itself which will hopefully assist those voters that, you know that have some vision problems they can go look at the ballot identify exactly where the person is that the, what they want to do and then when they go over they'll have this the, the same replica ballot you know in, in their hand and the other thing that we're hoping to do is to have people go to our poll site locator on the web you can type in your address and that will direct you not only to where your poll site is but you can look at the ballot for your particular election district as well as the uh, propositions. So with all of that outreach, we're hoping that that offsets uh, to some extent the, uh, the, the six-point font. And moving forward, you know, I'm meeting with ES on, uh, on on uh, the 24th, and we have to start discussing what alternatives we have moving forward, uh, you know, and not the least of which is, you know, in a perfect world, you know, we could go to two language ballots across the board. Um, it, it couldn't happen for this election cycle. Was, you know, the decision wasn't made uh, quickly enough. Uh, but it's still going to be an added expense, and we need to plan for that budgetarily as well. Because in the beginning, you know, the last thing you want to do is run out of ballots if you're, you know, if you're uh, running an election. Say, you don't want to put, sorry, we're closed, you know, stop, you know. Can't do that, right? So we need to have enough ballots. 
one of the things that they wanted us to do, or we would like to do, is to gather data back from the voters to say, what is your language preference, to give us some guidance, you know, in, in that regard. Um, we have found, you know, looking backwards on prior efforts at, at response, that, you know, we don't get a lot of response back, you know, from the voters. So then if we, even if we do that outreach and we go to that expense, how much fruit is that going to bear? So we probably have to go to some hybrid of that, which may involve some voter outreach, but then also involve us making value judgments based on the voter turnouts in, in various areas. And I, and I think we're going to make you know, some progress in, in, in that regard you know, in the upcoming uh, general election, not this upcoming general election. We're already looking past that for planning purposes. Uh, and, and we're going to start making some judgments, I think, as well, in terms of ballot purchases based on voter turnout, rather than doing it citywide, right? We ordered 90% of the ballots, so it's 4.3 million registered voters. We ordered 90% of 4.3 million, down from 115% in the presidential. Now, that's still a lot. And it's still an over, overspending, if you will. But there are some jurisdictions within New York State that order 300 percent of the of the total ballots. As a matter of fact, the New York State Comptroller is doing an audit presently on on who orders what ballots. And why would somebody order 300 percent of the ballots? Well, if you go to vote, you can make a mistake twice and have your ballot voided, and get up to three ballots prior to a court order. So some jurisdictions have taken that to the extreme to say, well, in the worst case scenario, everybody shows up to vote, everybody makes a mistake twice, and then we'll run out of ballots. New York hasn't taken, New York City hasn't taken that unreasonable uh, position, but by the same token, you know, again, the dirty word of disenfranchisement hangs out there for everybody that's involved in the election process, and we're, no, uh, we're not insensitive to that either. So we, we took a step down and knocked it down, say, 25% this election cycle, as a, a spot where we felt safe that we could accommodate, uh, you know, the needs of everyone, save some money but not strip it to the bone. Uh, but moving forward, the next step in that analysis has to be to analyze the voter turnout in in a more, you know, geographic sense and say, okay, we know that this these particular place in gubernatorials has a 60% voter turnout. But this spot has a 10% voter turnout. We don't necessarily have to order 90% of the ballots for the spot that has a 10% voter turnout, and maybe we can do that in a more specialized way and, and spend the, the precious resources that we get from the New York City taxpayers as, as, as wisely as possible. So I, I just wanted to weigh in a little bit on the, on the font controversy, as you will. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certain... I can't be completely certain, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I'm certain that, that nobody uh, saw me on the debrief with David Ushery because I didn't see myself. It was on at 5.30 on Sunday morning, uh, but we, we had a conversation about this. And I also was on there with somebody who was far more interesting than me, a young man who, who invented the latest version of the Rubik's Cube, but it is a Rubik's Cube that is a, not a cube, but a cylinder. And it's not a Rubik's cylinder, it's whatever this guy's name is. And it's, <laughs> you mix all the colors up and then you have to get it all back together again. It seemed to be very complicated and I would never be able to do it. But, the, but he seemed like a nice guy and he, he's probably going to be a gazillion there, you know? In the meantime, next year I'll be back on Ushery talking about the font size again and he'll be retired in Costa Rica or something. <laughs> Come on, there's hope. Right. So, you know, there may be a solution out there. Right. We'll talk so, later. You know, so that's, that's, that's where we're at with that. And, and, you know, like I said, there's a lot of uh, groups out there, you know, that, that have interest in us. We, you know, since I, uh, uh, I came in, I've only been there two months, we've had two meetings already with uh, what we call the, the big government groups and, and folks. And hopefully, you know, it's my desire to keep that open door policy because uh, even though you don't always agree you know nobody has cornered the market on, on, on good ideas and I, and I think it's only in that that free, free flow of uh, uh, discussion where ideas can get vetted I mean sometimes I'll say to my staff you know you're the new guy so they're always a little bit reticent you know to to say anything and I say look 
the way that I solve problems is I have to speak what I think is the solution. Sometimes that's only the first step in the process. Sometimes it's just getting the crazy out. You know, an idea sounds good in your head until you say it, and then you start to really have a conversation about what the impact of doing something a certain way is, and, and you need that vetted by a, a good and, and dedicated staff. And I said, look, I'm inviting the discussion. So, you know, that's kind of where we're at. That's the, the issues uh, du jour for this week. Uh, and if anybody has uh, any, any questions of me or, you know, wants to know anything, I'm certainly happy to, to answer anything that anybody's got to say. Well, I'll ask Stuart to share a survey that we did in the taxis. So you hear okay. what some of New Yorkers said as well. So you okay. can take some down. I have an extra Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, just want to thank you for uh, for coming here. I wish you the best of luck two months in. I know you've had a lot to take on. Thank you. And uh, vitally important job, obviously. And and we're uh, we hope you continue to come and send a representative and also. Forward to work. I have a nameplate now, so I, I got to show up now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have we have many of the same goals uh, and uh, some of the same uh, desires to move things forward. So we're looking forward to working with you on this. And and the other thing too uh, that we've started the early, very very early stages of we're trying to. Um, the College of Staten Island has a uh, high uh, speed. A computer processing center, and we're, we're in the process of negotiating the MOU with them. I hope it gets gets off the ground to, to help us uh, scrub the voter rolls, and and uh, you know, and see and see if we can right size uh, the voter rolls. There's there's a lot of work that needs to be done before we can go ahead and start doing that stuff. But I've been uh, preliminarily in contact with the Department of Health to make sure that we're getting uh, the most updated death records. Uh, I've also been in contact with the State Department of Corrections. Uh, they're going to give us some uh, data of people who've been imprisoned and people who are also on parole so that we can you know, start getting people off the, uh, the rolls that, that, that don't belong there. For example, uh, if we had, say, and I think it's going to be more, but let's say we had 100,000 people on the rolls that don't belong there, right? Just in mailings alone, we would save $67,000 per mail, just in mailings alone. And that's just us. That's now you guys, I'm sure, take your data from us. Yes. Yeah. So this is an expensive piece of mailing that you put together. So to the extent that our information is inaccurate, your mailings are inaccurate mm -hmm. and, they go, and you're wasting money. Mm -hmm. Now multiply that by you guys, elected officials, both city and state, that use our data, and then also multiply that by publicly funded candid campaigns in the uh, city that are also using the same data. And when you look at that mushroom effect, I think that that is potentially millions of dollars that can be said. And I'm, I'm not saying that, that's not even a conservative, you know, uh, an exaggeration. That's conservative. So if we're saving, you know, $67,000 per mailing, and it's a relatively cheap mailing because we're buying 4.3 million pieces and the mock-up is, cost is absorbed and spread out over 4.3 million. What cost does that mock-up cause, you know, for a candidate that's, that's going to do a 10,000 piece mailing? That's the cost per mailing is going to, going to jump way up from it. So, you know, and then you multiply that over the course of time. So that's, that's the stuff that, that, that we're looking at seriously. And I, I think that just because we have the access and the ability to spend money doesn't mean we should. Mm -hmm. and, and taking it to the point of, well, you know, it's just $100,000. You know, we, we, our, our budget's 125 to $130 million when you factor in all the specials, you know, over the course of the year. And if you took the, it's just a hundred thousand dollars every single time you spent a hundred thousand dollars. Well, if, if you say that ten times a year, you just wasted a million dollars. So you know, I I look at my check, and they take a nice chunk of change out of my paycheck every two weeks, and uh, I 
endeavor to spend the money at the Board of Elections the way that I would spend my own money. And you can talk to my wife and kids and they'll tell you I'm not always the loosest guy. I'm not so cheap, but I'm not, I'm not, you know, uh, a spendthrift either, so, you know. Uh, I, I look at it like it's all of our money and we shouldn't waste it. And, uh, you know, so that's an effort that we're going to be making, you know, moving, moving down the road, you know, to try to save uh, some money. And, and then moving forward, we have to, we really have to take a hard look at this technology that we're using for elections now and find out, you know, what's this, whether there's a better way to run the railroad. And there are other options out there. One of them, uh, which is, you may hear discussed, uh, you know, is ballots on demand. Uh, but that requires, you know, some data collection perhaps. Uh, but it, it may not. And so, you know, that, but it does require an expenditure. Because there's more equipment that has to be delivered to the, uh, to the poll site. Because the ballots on demand, the way they're going to be doing them in California, is you see, but, but you don't have to uh, bounce an 1,100-pound machine up the stairs. Right. You're going in with it much lighter. Except, but the difference is, the difference is, those 1,100-pound machines were bought and paid for a really long time ago. Right. So, so now, if we're going to go to do something else, it's not just a question of you know moving the equipment. That's one issue. Mm -hmm. But then we'd have to get the. Uh, budgetary approval to purchase additional equipment because the way that it would, the way that's been described to me that it would work is it would be in order to maximize ballots on demand, you would have to transition from a paper sign-in book to an electronic sign-in book. Right. And so you now, we're not using pieces of paper anymore, now we're using tablets or some form of, of the latest technology that allows for stylus, you know, right? So now that then generates a card, which you then take and put into another machine, which then gives you your ballot. Now there's the one way that it's being used in jurisdictions now that I know is they've already done their data collection and they know that you want your ballot in English. And they know I want my ballot, well, I'll just pick a language, Bengali, right? So when I go in, my Bengali language ballot prints up. The question that I'm going to be asking of the tech folks that I'm meeting with at ESNS on Thursday is, can the system be programmed to prompt and ask which language you want the ballot in, as opposed to having to have your ballot language <coughs> preference already pre-programmed in the system? Because that may be, you know, uh, another way to do it. Uh, all you need are PDFs right. or, or some sort of right, mm -hmm. but like a pointer and you know. But again, I mean, when you talk about making it available in all languages, well, then we also have to make sure that we have enough time to do all of the test deck requirements. Because if you look at your ballot on election day, and you guys might be familiar with this, so if I'm sorry for being redundant or going over something you already know, you'll see a series of dashes across the top, a series of dashes down the side, and a series you know, on each side, and a series of dashes <coughs> along the bottom. Those are not there to make the ballot look pretty. Those are timing marks. That's what sets the machine up. That's what allows the machine to read the ballots. I mean, obviously they get programmed, but they get programmed to where those timing marks intersect so that the ovals get red. Well, depending on the ballot setup, each one of those ballots has to be programmed in so that the machine recognizes it. Now my understanding is that the memory capability for the various ballot styles of these machines is more than sufficient to accommodate any number of languages that we might want to input. But we still have to build all those ballots electronically and then have the hard copies and then do all of the test decking requirements to make sure that when those machines get rolled out on election day, they're all good. So it's not just a question of do you want to print it in another language or not. It's you have to be able to do it, and then it has to have the added bonus of the machine actually has to work. This is for the scanner and not break or for down. the MD? For the scanner. For the scanner. Right. And, and, and not break down. And not break down. Break, uh, right. break down. Right. Break down. I was curious about a lower tech solution though in the interim which would be can you not print 
one ballot that say is English and Spanish, and then another ballot that's Chinese or you know and Korean, and then you know Bengali, and if there's a sixth language, Bengali, as we do with right. the voter guide, where if we were to put all five languages in for Queens, you know it would be a phone book. Right. So M my understanding is that it would be English and every other language that you would want. So if we were to do it, like say for Queens, it would be English and Korean, English and Chinese, English and Spanish, English and Bengali, right? Now, the other option that's in a little bit more, since we have less requirements, believe it or not, for English and Spanish than we do for English and the other languages. The other option that the, the techies in, you know, in the, the folks, the training folks in, in our agency are, are favoring, but I, I haven't gotten all the way there with them yet, is to do a three language ballot. English and Spanish, and then English and every other language. English, Spanish, and every other language. Right, in the areas where we need. Mm -hmm. So what that would do is that would limit us citywide to two ballot types. English and Spanish, since we have to do that everywhere. And then, in those areas where needed, English, Spanish, and, and you know, pick the next language, Bengali, you know. But and, then you'd still have to have English, Spanish, and Bengali, English, Spanish, and Chinese, correct. English, Spanish, Korean. I'm not, saying it's, I'm not saying it's the perfect solution. I'm saying that that's, a, 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 in addition to what you discussed, that's another alternative. Mm -hmm. the, the, the other alternative would be to have English and Spanish, English and Chinese, English and Korean, you know, and, and so on down the line. And one of the reasons, and I can tell you very honestly why that hasn't been done yet, money. And the thought was, you know, before I got there, that you need to do the demographic analysis and the solicitation of information from the voters to see which their ballot preference is so that you get a better understanding of the universe that you're dealing with mm -hmm. and then order right. appropriately. Exactly. As opposed to just saying, we have X amount of uh, Bengali speakers in, in this uh, you know, particular area of Queens and irrespective of, of election district, we're just going to order this many for each polling place and then spend you know, you know, no, thousands you wanted, and thousands you of know. Right. If you were to gather that preference data, by the way, we would use that to help narrow our focus in sending out the voter guides in alternate languages as right. well. So well, it would be... Well, right now, we, we, I, I don't even know what it would take to gather that information. One of the things that I'm going to do, however, is I'm going to call Mr. Dean uh, from uh, Los Angeles, and I'm going to speak to him because uh, I know that they've embarked on a two-year process to try to gather this information as best they can. They deal with nine mandated languages in L.A. County, and they also make eight additional languages above the nine available. So they, they're dealing with a total of 17 languages. Right now we're dealing with five. Uh, you know, so they, they have some expertise. I'm not pretending to, you know, to, to know it as, as much as they know about it. So I'm going to hopefully not reinvent the wheel and, and, and grab some of, of, of their uh, knowledge. There are two other right. addicts that, you know, I don't know. Just two? Uh, uh, you know, on this, <laughs> you have the full-face ballot requirements because you can sound language really simply if you don't have full-face ballot. Correct. Applications. And then ballot rotation. Right. And that's where the cost of printing the ballots... Uh, yeah, the ballot works. rotation's an issue. And, and I also, uh, not smartly, and not smartly I mean by to me a wiseacre about it, um, I, I was discussing with Assemblyman Cavanaugh today about, well, which one of your colleagues would want to go to page two? Keep in mind that Assembly is at the bottom of... Of the of the stacking uh, order when ballots are busy, so if the, if we ran out of room on the ballot, tell me which assembly persons will go to page two, and then we'll see how much of a political problem we have with going to a two-page ballot or not. Even assuming that we can overcome the programming issue with respect to the scanner machines only accounting <coughs> for pages and not accounting for ballots. So there's a, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of moving parts to the system, and I think. You know, when folks simply zero in on the fact that, you know, we have a, a difficult uh, difficulty with the font size, uh, you know, all of those other issues aren't being fully uh, taken into account. 
let me kind of okay. reassure you that uh, remember, I don't know how many people in this room remember buff cards. Oh, and we, we have an issue with those too. But we'll in, in, in 1987, <laughs> we got rid of the buff cards. You did, huh? You think you did? Well, you know where the buff cards still are? I, I, Every I know one where of the them that were there in 1997 are. still exist. Some of them are on their file cabinets and are gone, and then nobody knows where they really are. But, but they're still there. Well, we're required, I, I, by I law, we're required by law to keep them for two years. That's, and, and, and that's another but, battle, but this battle point, I'm having. You know, I remember back then people saying, but we have to have signatures. And the idea of scanning signatures from the buff cards was just foreign to most people. So. Right. And uh, Ms. Lepress, can, can, uh, she can attest to the fact that on election days I have been a field commander. I don't. I don't sit in the. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't sit in the uh, 42 Broadway. I get out there and see what's going on, right? Yep. Is that my full sight? Is that your full sight? <laughs> so you know. Uh, but yeah, we have, we have a lot of challenges, and I th I think keeping uh, the lines of communication with everybody open is a you know is an important thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so well, much. No problem. Thank, you, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having thank me. Do we have any other um, any testimony from the public? I would actually okay. mention one oh, no, thing. Yeah. Sorry. I can see uh, you over there. I'm sorry. Hiding in the corner. Um, Will Colgrove from Gail Brewer's office. So, uh, uh, Mr. Ryan's here. This is actually something you want to thank the Board of Elections for um, through a hearing that actually came out of the committee that Councilmember Brewer chairs in the City Council, governmental operations. We look obviously trying to work with the board on solving a number of the problems we face. One of the most common complaints, obviously, of voters is. Uh, Poll workers being, you know, being either unhelpful or giving misinformation. Uh, so thanks to the direction of Mr. Ryan and the staff of the Board of Elections for launching a pilot uh, to train attorneys as poll workers uh, for this year's election. So we're trying to get the word out about that program, recruit as many people as we can uh, in a bipartisan fashion. And, and on that note, if I could just jump in right there, uh, Republicans, we need more Republican lawyers. Um, because the idea of this pilot program is that in they're going to be I'm a Democrat and I'm a lawyer. This is not the point. It, it's, just it, it's just I understand, but the the idea is that the uh, the pilot is is for bipartisan teams of lawyers to go, particularly to problematic districts, uh, hopefully just to, to solve problems. Well, uh, we're finding that the number of uh, uh, Democratic uh, lawyers uh, volunteering is, is outstripping the, the number of uh, Republicans by a pretty wide margin. So, uh, you know, you know, folks that happen to be, you know, a Republican lawyer that wants to get continuing legal education credit for participating in this process, and, and you know, and get paid a little bit. It's not a lot of money, but they get paid something for election day. Uh, that's a good thing. So I'm sorry, William, I interrupted you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a big sum. Yeah. But anyway, if anyone has any, obviously I have flyers information and wants it, but yes, as, as we said, we need to get as bipartisan outreach as we can. So if anyone has suggestions, talk to me or go directly to the board. Thank you. All right, now we're Yeah, and, uh, I'll pass these around if people want them. Is, is and if you're in the uh, training dates are on the back as well if people want them. Can we link to something online? Yeah, yeah um, I think I sent Eric left, but I sent Eric the flyer, but I'll, I can report that to you too. Oh, okay, thank you. And then just as a, an amusing anecdote, I had sent uh, Council Member Brewer a, uh, an email letting her know that the ballots went on the web, uh, because that was something that uh, she's had a keen interest in. And um, she sent me a quick email back and said, thanks, Mike. And it was in 6.5. <laughs> seven seven points, that's a small dream. Oh, was it 7.5? Yeah. But, it's, I, but I, did get, I, I did get I did get a good laugh out of it. Yes. Did you win yeah. a test one? Sure. Um, I'm Andy Morrison from Nyberg. Thanks. And I uh, just want to thank and commend voter advisory assistant. Uh, Assistant Advisory Committee um, for all the work we do. And uh, also, uh, Executive Director Ryan alluded to it, but he has had meetings and uh, we've taken part, and uh, it's been very helpful, so thanks. Um, we look forward to more. Um, so, Nyberg is having a voter helpline 
we did this on the primary and we've done it for most elections for like you know, 25, 30 years. And so um, between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. on November 5th, uh, voters can call our hotline. And that number is 212-822-0282. Um, so you know, I encourage everyone to let people know about that. We're going to be doing work with the media to get our number out there and expect uh, a good deal of calls. We had several hundred people call in during the primary. And people call with questions ranging from where can I vote, where's my polling site, um, to I had a problem at the polls, can you help me solve it? And um, you know, we have a relationship with people at the BOE where we um, forward some of the complaints. Um, and it's just really helpful to gain insight into what the voters' experience is like at the polls so that we can continue to better the process. And one of the things that I've stressed, you know, amongst our staff, uh, because, you know, people that are busy, and especially on Election Day, that that's our, you know, busiest days of the year, the days that we're running elections, you know, they're like, oh, this is like another individuals that we're going to have calls from. And, and the point that I've made is that groups like Nightbird that are out there on Election Day are our eyes and ears in places where we can't be they can be, and even if the call happens to be redundant, it doesn't mean it doesn't have value. So one of the things that we've uh, worked with most recently with Nightbird is telling them the specific types of information that we need when we get a complaint, because everything is computerized. So it's coming into a central call location, but then it needs to be routed appropriately within the system. And, and often, you know, uh, a regular member of the public, a regular civilian member of the public that's not familiar with the voting process, will, will not have uh, complete information. So to the extent that we can, we're educating uh, the good government groups that are going to be out there on, on, on Election Day to have their folks give us the information as specifically as we possibly can have it so that we can deal with the problems, you know, as, as efficiently as possible. And so I, I look at, at that as an, an extension and a partnership, not as, you know, kind of the, an us-them mentality. I think we're all in this together and, and we need to work together. Thank you. Um, just one other point is uh, that we're having um, uh, volunteers out in the field as well. So we'll be actually surveying um, between 30 and 40 poll sites. We hope to see how things are going in real time. Uh, happy to report back if you have any questions down the road. And thanks again. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I guess we know all the forms. We can't really vote at the meeting, but I guess uh, you just you had say, a you guys, you're all going to have to stay. <laughs> <laughs> the meeting can't be adjourned. It's no longer a forum. <laughs>